Well, good afternoon. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. I was asked to share uh, the gladiolas, uh, the beautiful gladiolas you see behind me here, are, are from Jeff and Jeline Warren, uh, uh, given in honor of Grandpa Ebert Storks. August birthday, and I think you said it was the 14th, I think that's what she told me, uh, is his birthday, and so something family has done for many years, as, as I was told. So they are beautiful, absolutely lovely as well. I was also asked just to share, um, as you're thinking in your prayers tonight, to remember um, T.J. Dick and Keith Madsen and their families as well. We begin our time of worship with our prayers for reconciliation, which you'll find on page 94 in the Red Hymnal. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin now in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn, we're going a little old school, is not... Number 506 in the red hymnal, it is number 506 in the green hymnal, for those whose memories will go back that far, but it's printed for you on the back of your bulletin.
Let's pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah, the 55th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See? I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Hi everybody, it's time for another children's message today. So as I was walking over here to the chapel, I thought, man, I am hungry. I get hungry at work a lot. So what would you think if we had a snack right now? Would that be okay if we had a little snack? I brought a snack with me. So I have this bag of some almonds and a stick of string cheese. And I thought that I would share with you. But now I'm looking at my snack. I just have this. And inside my bag, I only have three almonds. That's probably not going to feed all of us, is it? Hmm. Well, I wouldn't be able to share with you through the screen anyway, right? But... This reminds me of something that happened to Jesus and his disciples. They were really, really tired, and they decided that they needed to get away from all the people, and they needed to rest and have some time by themselves. So they got in a boat, and they went over to a quiet place to rest. And when they got there, there were people there already, and the people were waiting for Jesus. And the Bible says that there were at least 5,000 men, and then we don't even know how many women and children there were. So there were at least 5,000 grown-ups that were men, and they wanted Jesus to teach them, and they wanted Jesus to heal their sick friends, and they wanted Jesus to spend time with them. Well, Jesus really, really needed to rest, and he was really tired, But when he saw all these people who were waiting for him and who loved him and needed him, he loved them so much that he just forgot that he was tired. And he went and he healed the sick and he taught them things that they needed to know and he spent time with them. So as time went on, soon it was time to eat and the disciples were hungry. And they went up to Jesus and they said, Jesus, it's getting late and we're hungry. So send these people away so that we can go get something to eat. And Jesus answered and he said, you don't need to send them away. You feed them. Well, they looked around. Remember how many people were there? At least 5,000 men plus the women and children. 
And they said to Jesus, feed them. How are we going to be able to feed them? We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. So imagine that in your mind. Five loaves of bread, two fish, and well over 5,000 people. Jesus told the disciples to bring him the loaves and the fish and to tell everybody else, all those people, to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the loaves of bread and the fish and he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks to God. Then he gave the food back to the disciples and told them to go give the food to the people. Now, if I were going to share my three little almonds and my stick of cheese with you today, we might be able to all have a tiny bite, right? But when Jesus blessed that bread and that fish, the Bible tells us that every single person ate until they were full, not just a snack. They filled their bellies. And wait, that's not even all. There's more. After everyone had eaten and everybody was full, they gathered up the leftovers. There were leftovers. And do you know how much? Not just a little bit. 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. After Jesus blessed those five loaves and two fish. Can you imagine that? Five loaves of bread and two fish. They feed at least 5,000 grown-ups, plus more kids. And then they have 12 baskets left over. That is what God can do. That is awesome, right? So what can we learn today? We learn that when we give what we have to God, he can then take it and bless it and he can do more with it than we could ever imagine. <clears throat> Even though we think we don't have very much, little becomes much, much more when God has it in his hands. So if you think, oh, I only have five pennies for offering. If we give those five pennies to God, who knows what he can do with that? Or maybe you're going to donate some food to the food pantry and you're thinking to yourself, oh, we only have one can of soup. That's not going to help enough people. But you know what? If we give that to the food pantry and we ask God to bless it, he can do marvelous things with it. So no matter how much you have, how little you think you have, maybe you think that you can only um, share a toy with one person and that just doesn't matter because it's only one. All those things when you think to yourself, oh, it's too small. It's never too small for God. He will use anything that you can give him to bless all kinds of other people, all of his children. So let's remember that this week. And if you happen to eat some bread or some fish, it can remind you that we give our little to God and he blesses it and shares it with many. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all of the stories that you share with us in the Bible. Help us today to remember that no matter how small our gift might seem, no matter how small our idea might seem, that if we give it to you and we ask you to bless it, you can take it and bless many, many, many more people than we can even imagine. Thank you for being a God of miracles and thank you for being a God of love. In your name we pray, amen. All right, that's it for today. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope that you get to see some God winks in your world during the week, places where you don't expect to see him and then he shows up. Um, I hope to see you soon and go out there and love your neighbor. Take care. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there 
in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You, feed, you give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed, and broke, broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you. I'm going to grab my clicker while you're up. Don't need the notes. Thank you. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, when we are confronted by the struggles of this world, this life, it is easy for us to be afraid. So now give us the gift of your spirit and open us up to the possibilities of what you are doing and what you will do. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so um, I know that we have been doing all of this self-study, right, and getting ready for the call process. We have a call committee now. We will install them next Sunday. We're ready for now the last stage of the process as <clears throat> we start to look at uh, who might be the next pastor here at First Lutheran. And <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I've been fascinated in these conversations uh, by, by how optimistic you all are uh, about uh, the future of this congregation as well. So if I asked you from 1 to 10, uh, where um, 10 is, uh, you are ecstatic about how things are going, this is the best church on the entire, on the entire planet in terms of liveliness and everything going great, and, and one being, um, you're pretty sure that this will be the last church service you'll attend here at first. Um, where, where would you put yourself? Um, any, any tens? Any ones? Okay, Whew, I'm glad to hear that. All right, somewhere in the middle, I'm going to guess, because, of course, being in the middle is what we like to be best, right? Five, six... Four, it is kind of fascinating as I'm listening to conversations that I hear a certain level of pessimism um, that, that I was reminded of as, as I'm reading, of course, this, this really well-known story, right, of Jesus feeding the crowds, the loaves and the fishes and all that that goes with. And, and at the heart of that story is exactly that question, how optimistic are we when confronted with the situation, whatever it is, current, future, whatever. So I, so I have noticed that there is a certain level of pessimism here, and, and, and it's pretty common, not unusual at all in churches as well. Right? I hear uh, a couple of comments. I hear, uh, there are no children. We have no children in this church anymore, right? We have no youth in this church anymore, right? Do you know that that's not true? So First Lutheran Church is the ninth largest worshiping congregation in the Nebraska Synod ELCA. Did you know that? Ninth largest of all of the ELCA churches in Nebraska. Number nine at 241 uh, average per week. So just some examples. A, a, uh, the fourth largest one is a church in West Omaha that worships 383 people. The uh, fifth largest is a South Omaha suburb, about 357 
the, the sixth largest actually church that compares very well to FLC in terms of size and community, about 273 a weekend. Look at the Sunday school numbers. They're the same. First communion classes, eh, about in the middle, right? 6 through 12, about in the middle, about normal, maybe a little higher, certainly bigger than, than the big Omaha church. We confirmed more, in fact, than that West Omaha church that is almost half again as big as us. There are a lot of children and youth in the ministry of this congregation. You should know that. I mean, I understand that it's different now because we don't have Sunday school and we don't see them because of the way the programming has changed, the way that we do programming for youth and children. But we have every bit as many youth and children in the programs of this congregation as does anybody in the Synod. Um, Worship attendance. Maybe you're all concerned about worship attendance. You're seeing a little space here around you. I hear people talking about that all the time, right? This is worship attendance this year compared to last. Last April... Total worship attendance this April, of course, being the month we had Easter, a little over 1,000 people. This year, 1,448 in the month of April. 513 in June last year, 613 in May. 585 in June, 732. And then just last month, a year ago, 698. This July, 732. Worship attendance is increasing, has been increasing steadily for almost two years now here at First Lutheran Church. Since COVID, since COVID, worship attendance continues to increase and improve here. Did you know that? I, by the way, the other one I know that you'll ding me on is, well, Pastor, we know that there's financial problems because we saw Chad's letter and all of that, right? That one letter that went out on the emails, we had twice as much revenue in July as we had expenses. Just like that. All we did was say, hey, pay attention to your giving, and you fixed it. Okay, maybe not fixed it, but, but still. Right? This is a healthy church. By every measure and metric that we use to measure churches, this church is just fine. So why is it that we are always convinced that we are so certain that it's not? I mean, and I understand, I I have memories of the church of my childhood too, and and we all have those, those golden days, right, that we picture when the church was bursting at the seams and it seemed like everybody went to church. It's just not that different. There's something else there. And, 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 while I'm certainly not going to deny that we all wish there was more, and, and of course we want to continue to work hard and do our mission well, at the heart of this is a spiritual problem. Not just a technical problem, not a programmatic problem, most certainly not a staff program problem here at this church, by the way. Right? A spiritual problem that we are always inclined to see the worst. Maybe not always, but way too often. And it is captured so beautifully by the disciples in today's story of the feeding of the 5,000. So when it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Never mind that Jesus, with no prior announcements, no PR program, summons this massive crowd to himself. I mean, he had gone away, right? You got that out of the story. He was overwhelmed with the news of the beheading of John the Baptist. He had gone off to be by himself. When he comes back on the boat, ta-da, a massive crowd. 5,000, not counting women and children. But the disciples don't see the miracle that's happening, that people are flocking to Jesus to hear his word, to experience firsthand the grace of the kingdom of God. Instead, all they see are way too many mouths, 
that they do not have the resources to feed. They do not see the abundance of hope. They only see the scarcity of bread. And they are afraid. Does that remind you of anybody that you know? I mean, isn't that really essentially the challenge of life? That we should see the abundance of the grace of God in our midst every single day. That we should be constantly filled with that joy and that praise should always be on our lips. But instead, we are always afraid. Even when things are really good, it's like, yeah, but but what bad thing is going to happen now? What What a terrible thing about us. That we are mostly driven by fear by that sense of scarcity, by that anxiety and worry that it's all going to go away. And what does that fear do to us? And what does that fear make us do to others? I have no doubt that the hatred and the anger and the violence that has become so prevalent in our world today, and that is, by the way, also so much a part of the church now, is because of that fear. We are worried about the scarcity of resources. We can't possibly let anybody else into this country, can we? We are worried about God's potential wrath and anger at our church. And so we will now have a purification process and we will go through person by person and kick out all of the ones who we think might be endangering our hope and our future. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, what are you afraid of? Don't don't send the crowd away. Don't Lose your moment. Don't give up. Instead, he does two things in the face of this challenge. The first is that he has compassion for this crowd. Right? I think I have said this before. One of my favorite Greek New Testament words, splagnitsomai. He has literally a feeling in the depth of his gut about these people would do anything for them. And that compassion, that love, is what drives him. It's what gathers the crowd. It is the very nature of his presence. It is what will save us from our fear. Instead of being afraid, where is our compassion? Instead of being anxious, where is our pity and our hope? for those in need. I believe we would think very differently. I am certain we would act very differently if that was what guided us in our work as people, as individuals, as a community, as a church. I have no doubt that is the one thing that would save us if we needed saving. And that would be that we had Jesus' compassion for the world around us. The other thing is, is of course, his response directly to the disciples. This is, well, you give them something to eat. How do you solve fear? Get to work. What do you do when you don't know what else to do? You do whatever you can. In the end, I think this saying might be right, idle hands are the devil's playground. It is when we are unsure of what to do that we mostly just turn in on ourselves and worry. But when we embrace our mission, when we embrace our work, when we do the things we are here to do and do them to the fullest of our ability, then then miracles happen. Then, surprisingly, a few loaves and fish turn out to be exactly what's needed and more. It is our work that undoes our fear. And I think I hear Jesus calling us to that every single day. You feed them. You house them. 
You care for them. You provide for them. You comfort them. You take care of them because that's why you're there. And instead of being afraid of them, let us be about the business of serving them. I think that would change everything. Now let me say something uncomfortable. What if we're not in a great place here at First Lutheran? What if, in fact, we aren't the church we used to be in? What if, in fact, there are tougher days ahead? What if, in fact, this church is not going to get bigger, but maybe stay the same or, heaven forbid, get smaller? What if, in fact, the hard days are still ahead? So what? Is that the most important thing? The level of attendance at church services, is that the most important thing? The size of our budget, is that the only important thing? The number of children that we count on, on children's program night on Wednesday at life night? What if it's hard? When did we decide to define the importance and effectiveness of our work as a church by the number of people who attended our programmings? When did we decide to let the world set the standards for whether or not we were being faithful? There's a beautiful line in the Isaiah reading there where Isaiah is giving all of these very hopeful messages to the Israelites. And then he turns to them and says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Maybe at the heart of it, our fear and anxiety is because we have expectations that don't actually matter. And we're working really hard on things that really don't change anything and won't count in the end. What does it mean for us to be faithful? I don't think it necessarily has to mean that we have full pews or big confirmation classes. And ultimately, I think our joy as a community of faith, our joy as people, as followers of Jesus, is not going to come from any worldly standard, from any measurable outcome. It's simply going to come from our faithfulness, from our trust and hope in the God of Jesus Christ. I think the disciples were overwhelmed because all they could see were the worldly immediate needs of the crowd, and I think that happens to us too. All we see is what's right in front of us. All we see are the needs of this world. But what if there's more? What if, in fact, the only thing that counts is these words? Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. Our faith, you see, is the only thing in the end that saves. This promise of God, this grace so freely given, that is the only thing that counts. That will be the only thing that will save us. But here's the good news. That thing we have, that thing is here. That gift is freely given, and it is ours regardless of the size of our offering or our attendance or our children's program. No matter what happens now, we know that we are the beloved children of God. And as much as we keep that in front of us, we have nothing to fear. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn is number 515 in the red hymnal, Break Now the Bread of Life.
living together in trust and hope, then let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we are fearful creatures. We worry about everything, even about things that are not worth our worry and our anxiety. And We pray, Lord, that you would come now with your word of grace and set us free. Set us free from our worldly cares and wants and open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, O oh Lord, to know that you are good, that your grace rules over all things, that we are yours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, renew in us a sense of mission and purpose in this world. Send us out from our self-concerns that we might serve our neighbor even as you have served us. Teach us, O oh Lord, to feed the hungry and care for the needy and comfort those troubled and welcome those who are strange and help us, Lord, to be your presence in this world, in this time, in this place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, Father. We lift up to you this very needy world this afternoon. We pray for all of those who have been troubled by disasters, by storms, by fires, by floods, who are trying to cope with immeasurable heat and suffering. We ask, Lord, that you send help into this world, that you teach us what is good and right to do to care for one another, that you use us, O oh Lord, for the sake of all of your children in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we remember our friends and neighbors in need this day, and we pray for the sick and the hospitalized. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery and fighting disease. We pray, Lord, for those who grieve this day, that they should know that you always watch over your own. We ask, Lord, that you would remember all who we name before you now, aloud and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers, O oh Lord, we bring to you because of the grace and the mercy that you always have for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now the peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's just take a moment, please, and share God's peace with one another.
Let us pray. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so it is that we remember our Lord Jesus Christ and how on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread from the table and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and then he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this, he said, and remember me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it for them to drink. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, he said, and remember me. And so we pray together in the way he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you are communing in your pew this afternoon or joining us now on the live stream, receive this gift of the grace of God. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. <clears throat> this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let's pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's see, announcements-wise, the last Sunday of the month is kickoff Sunday, uh, the 27th, I believe, is that Sunday, 26th, 27th. Among other things going on, uh, we're going to have a good old-fashioned potluck lunch. So I'm looking for the real Lutherans out there. I expect to see at least two different kinds of jello, And I expect to see lots of people. We've been, I've heard from the very beginning, from the first day of arrival, we need more community, we need more opportunities to get together, sit down, share time. There it is. Take advantage. It'll be the final Sunday of the month as we kick off things into the fall, and we have a very, very busy fall planned as well. The, um, uh, why can't I remember the name of the cart uh, with the produce? The market, there it is is uh, out there now, so please uh, help yourself to some garden-raised goodies as well. Anything else for the good of the cause? Well, there's a backpack program. Okay. And also, on the 26th, the sign-up for Washington Sunday. Thank you. That Saturday morning, the 26th, is Washington is our day of volunteering out at Washington County Recycling. So that's, uh, that sign-up is out there, and yes, we are starting to gather uh, items for the backpack program. Uh, as well, and again, that's just part of the whole shift into fall and uh, maybe a shift out of some of this summer weather, just yeah, for fun, just for fun. Let us bow our hearts to God then and receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with mercy and grace. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn, Praise and Thanksgiving, is number 689 in the Red Hymnal.
peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.